Hey, I'm so glad that everybody is here. Um, this live discussion is going to be based off of the video that I posted last week over less commonly discussed female autistic characteristics. Um, you might hear my voice. I'm a little, I'm a little more tired this week and I'm trying to give myself the rest that I have needed. Um, but as you know, it's hard, especially as a parent. Um, and then Texas is drunk over here. It's like 70 degrees and then sleeting the next day and then 60 degrees the next day. And then it's supposed to snow today. So it's so random and my body's like, what is happening? But anyways, I'm so glad that y'all are here and I love seeing familiar, um, I was going to say faces. I love, I guess your profile pictures, I can see some of your faces, but I love seeing familiar people in the chat. So, um, to start out, if you have already seen the video or even if you haven't, um, I would love to hear in the comments, any characteristics that have resonated with you as a female on the spectrum, or if you're not diagnosed or suspected, um, autism diagnosis, you can answer as well. So it doesn't matter if you have a formal diagnosis or not, just which types of female autistic characteristics have stood out as something that you deal with in your life. Um, and then also, I thought it would be interesting if um, for whoever feels comfortable sharing the gender that you identify with, um, I think that could add to our discussion and we can kind of talk about how these female characteristics can apply to others as well not just females. Um, if somebody does, if people do share information about their gender, please no derogatory comments. This is a respectful space. And if you are disrespectful, then I will have to kick you out of our little chat. But I don't anticipate that because um, everyone on here right now, at least, is super, super cool and respectful. Um, okay. I'm not seeing any characteristics coming up here on the side, but I think in live streams in the past, um, it's been pretty delayed. Masking and suppressing stims. Okay, so I almost didn't put masking in the video because it was less common female autistic characteristics, but whenever I kind of polled the community, that was what everybody said, like so much masking, so much masking. That's the thing that sets me apart, you know, as a female on the spectrum. And so even though it's not necessarily less common, less commonly talked about, excuse me, um, I think the extent to which females mask is really pretty incredible. Um, so much so that I know for myself and others who received a diagnosis as an adult, that when you realize that you are autistic, it's kind of like, well, who am I? Like, am I my mask? Or what is my mask? What's not my mask? How do you differentiate between those two things? So it's almost kind of like an identity crisis and it's not a short lived identity crisis because this is something that, I mean, for me diagnosed at 31, it's like I've had 31 years of masking and trying to be something else that I didn't even understand. And then now realizing, oh, I don't have to mask. It's really, really complicated. So let me hear your thoughts on masking and kind of separating your masked self from your non-masked self. Like, does anybody have tips for identifying what's the part of you that's masking and what's the part of you that's not? Because I'm still, I'm still kind of figuring that out. I've also heard from some people that they think masking can be really useful. So like if you're if you have a social engagement and you need to, you know, put on a smile and be able to engage with someone to network for your job, like that could be helpful. Um, and I, I could see how that might be something felt by non autistics as well. Like we all mask in some ways sometimes. Right. Um, so in some ways that can be helpful, but for me personally, I have felt it kind of like be pretty jarring to realize that I've masked for so long and try to figure out what, who I am without masking. Like if I could just do what I want to do and not try to appease other people, who am I, right? Um, let me read through some of these comments over here. Hey, Anne's Augustine. I'm glad you're here. Whitney didn't know masking was a thing before. I'm guessing like before you kind of discovered that you were on the spectrum. Um, the question, <laughs> what was the question? I probably kind of went all over the place. Um, maybe tips for the question I'm asking you is who has any suggestions or tips for how you recognize the masked version of yourself versus the non-masked version of yourself? So like who you really are versus when you're masking. Do you have any tells where you realize like, oh, that's not really me. I'm trying to fit in and do something else that I don't want to do. 
So that's the long-winded version of the question that I'm asking. Um, yeah, Jim is saying that you find that people don't believe you about masking and eye contact. I know. I, I kind of get that same sentiment. It's like people, I think, on the outside can sometimes see what comes across as like social success, but they don't see the price that you pay for it. They don't see how you have to prepare for that. They don't see how you have to recover from that and how uncomfortable it is during how it kind of feels like you're selling out and like giving up a part of your soul to do it. Um, so yeah, it's frustrating to have other people kind of think that maybe things aren't the way that you say they are because it looks different on the outside, which just fits into the whole concept of masking, right? Um, Sue Ann says, making eye contact is a form of masking. It makes me deeply uncomfortable and I don't understand the rules. I, I think I've said it before, but I really don't hear what's being said if I'm looking at somebody in the eyes. It freaks me out. I just, it's like, I cannot register words if I am intentionally looking someone in the eyes. And I feel like I in, like automatically engage fight or flight mode, like where I'm just like, I can't. I can't handle anything else other than looking in the eyes right now. And it's totally, totally overwhelming. Hey, mommy vlogs. I'm reading some of the comments. Yeah, Sarah says she struggles to know who she truly is outside of masking. Me too. I'm, I feel like I'm getting better. More on that in just a second. Typing with a baby at my feet. You go girl. That's awesome. Um, if your cheeks hurt from smiling, you're probably masking unless you're over the top with an outward show of joy. People think that you're upset. Yeah. I think, I feel like I remember hearing that a lot, especially when I was younger, like smile, you know, and that, that goes into a whole nother thing about females and, and society and everything. It's so frustrating. Yeah. Having to go home from an event, Gemma, at least, I mean, I'm proud of you for making that decision, you know, to go home when things get uncomfortable. Cause I think for so long in my life, I would just stay at events when I was uncomfortable. Um, we had an event at my kid's school this week. It was an open house. It was like a random open house where you could come in and see things that the kids have been working on. And I was spent like, this was at the end of the day. It's almost spring break. And I was like, I do not have the energy to do this. So I put in my headphones I forgot to put them in today, put in my headphones and, um, I wore a hat cause I'm realizing that a hat kind of helps me feel like more secluded and like I have more privacy from other people. And then I wore really comfortable clothes and tennis shoes, which normally I feel like, I don't know, I guess this, yeah, this would be masking, like feeling like when I go to the school, I need to look cute and like presentable and professional so I can like impress the teachers or whatever, or just like be a presentable parent. But I'm like this week I was like, I can't do that. That's not available to me. So I was like sweats, hat, earbuds. And we were like in and out. We did not, I, that was our plan going in. We're like, we're just going to see what we need to see. And then we're going to leave because I, I don't have it in me. Um, oh, I love all these moms have kids everywhere. My kids are in the other room playing video games. Lots of screen time today. Um, I mean, they had school today. So, um, Ashley, now that you have your diagnosis, it's a heavy feeling. Everything feels clunky, like you're talking through a barrier, but only when I'm already tired. Sometimes I mask without knowing. Thanks for sharing that. I'm sure many of us can resonate with that. The smile thing is exhausting. Um, Anne's Augustine says, I find that my anxiety rises when I'm not masking because I'm so hyper-focused on what everyone is doing or saying that I am in a state of worry over what I'm doing. It's a lot of, it can feel like a lot of overthinking, right? I feel like I spend so much time in my head. Like um, there's almost this place I go to when I zone out, like where when people are talking, it's like, I don't see anything. It's almost like my vision, like my visual input just kind of gets cut. And I go to this place in my brain where it's like only thoughts, like I'm not registering anything in my body, like only my thinking. I don't know if anybody else deals with that zoned out feeling. <laughs> I'm laughing at mommy vlogs, your Walmart comment. Um, yeah, so that was another thing too, the anxiety that kept coming up a lot. So whenever we mask and we pretend to be somebody that we're not, that can bring up a lot of anxiety, right? I mean, 
doesn't really need much explanation why that would bring up anxiety. But I remember, you know, finally realizing like, oh, anxiety isn't something that everyone deals with. That's so weird to me. Like anxiety is just like breathing. I, I mean, I hate saying that and I, it, I want it to not be that way. You know, I hope that I can make some progress and I feel like I am making progress in that area. But to me, anxiety is like, you know, my shadow, like I, it doesn't ever leave. And I remember kind of recognizing that that's not how everyone else experiences life. And I'm just completely baffled by that. Um, so unfortunately, I think I think chronic anxiety is something that a lot of women on the spectrum really deal with. And it's exhausting. I mean, masking is exhausting. But then on top of that, you have anxiety, which really does affect physically your body, your concentration, your energy level. It's exhausting for sure. I'm trying to stay up to date on these comments. Oh, you got anxious when somebody was asking you what you wanted to eat. Yeah, I always like think through. I don't like saying what I want to eat. Like I, I have to think through like how I'm going to say what I want from the menu and like what questions, what follow-up questions they might ask me. Like I'm just constantly turning through any potential responses that I'm going to be required to have whenever I'm interacting with someone in public. I like, I like wearing a mask now still. I mean, in my area, I mean, I live in Texas. Um, so people have been not wearing masks for a long time. Um, I love, I like wearing my mask. It makes me feel like I, I don't like germs. Not that anybody does, but I'm like hyper aware of germs. Um, so yeah, I like wearing masks still, even though people are starting to not wear them. Yeah. Thank y'all for all the comments over there. I really like hearing y'all stories and hearing perspectives because I feel like there's so many times on this channel when somebody will say something and they'll word it in a way that was like, that's what I've been wanting to say, but I did not know that those were the words to express what I wanted to say. Um, okay. So we've talked a lot about masking and I knew that, was, I mean, that's like the big one, right? And I said, I almost didn't put that in the video because it's not like a rare female autistic characteristic, but I feel like it just has to be on any list because it's like the extent to which we mask is just phenomenal. Like it's something like phenomenal in like a, not like in a positive way, but just in as an observation, like it's phenomenal how much of the time we spend masking. Um, oh, I'm sorry that your son was in the hospital or I assumed that it was a son. I don't know why. I'm sorry that your child was in the hospital. The hospital is so overwhelming. Yes. Okay. Um, another one, this was a suggestion from the channel that I included in the video was suppressing true honesty in order to make other people feel more comfortable. And I'm smiling because it's true, right? I, I'm trying to think like how my life would be different if I didn't suppress the things that I wanted to say when I was being, when I wanted to be honest, like when I stopped myself to make other people feel better. So I'm guessing that other people can resonate with that too, because I've, I've read a lot of comments about that. Um, but that, you know, that can also play into masking, you know, like making, changing what you feel like you want to share based on how it will be received by other people. That's exhausting. This is all exhausting. <sighs> um, Pass, I, you said you don't go to restaurants because you can't handle the stress. I feel like my practices there have changed so much since the pandemic because everything just became so much easier to pick up and order ahead and order online and then bring it home. And I just find that I prefer that. Like my husband and I are kind of old. <laughs> We're kind of like old people. If we go out to eat, like we like to eat at completely non-peak hours, like way before dinner, like we'll go eat at like three 30 or something. Or, you know, we just like, we went out to eat for my birthday this last weekend and I got it. We got a table at a restaurant and then the waiter like left to go get our drinks. And I looked at my husband and I was like, let's go to a different restaurant. <laughs> I just couldn't handle it. It was too crowded. So we like drove across the city and went somewhere else that didn't have as much of a rush. Cause I just, I just don't like dealing with it. <laughs> oh, Ryan, you're welcome here. It's okay. Um, it's okay. I'm glad, uh, glad to see that you have your new video up. I just saw it posted. So I'm excited to watch that. Um, Stacy says, I suppress, 
I'm guessing that's, I suppress what I need so others aren't put out. Yeah. 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 Ooh, I have a, um, I'm like in a group therapy thing and um, it meets every other week. And the topic that has been up for so long that we haven't gotten to that we're going to hit tomorrow is autistic preferences versus needs or autistic, uh, autistic needs being perceived as preferences. And I'm really excited to discuss that tomorrow with my group and come back with some more information on that for y'all, because I feel like that's a super important topic to discuss, right? Because I think a lot of people, when they hear about autism or like see you as a high functioning autistic person, which we won't unpack that right now, um, the use of that term, um, I think they can see that and think like, oh, well, we all have social anxiety sometimes, or we all have... um, you know, sensory overwhelm sometimes. So I think it's going to be really interesting to dive into that more and kind of talk about how to differentiate between needs and preferences and how to communicate that to other people. So I'm going to share that with y'all soon. Um, everybody, yeah, everybody says hi, O'Brien. Okay. So we talked about, um, honesty. So copy and paste behaviors. Oh my gosh. And I said this in the video, but this is how I knew, this is how I knew I was autistic because I was talking to a friend and she was like, yeah, so it just makes so much sense because we recognize there are all these copy and paste behaviors. She was talking about someone who had just been diagnosed as autistic. And she was like, yeah, like socially they would just copy other things that people did. And that's how they would communicate. And I just, I don't know what my face was doing when I received this information, but I was just like, but, but that, but like everyone does that, right? Like everyone is studying the other person during a conversation and like learning on the fly what to do, like to respond, right? Like, where do I put my hands? Where do I look? How do I like respond to let this person know that I'm not like, like interested, but not rude. You know, it's like, I just thought that that's, I think y'all have said it on the channel before, but there's always like three streams of consciousness going in my brain. One is like paying attention to the person in front of me and trying to listen to what they're saying and like register the information. And then the second one is like trying to anticipate what my body language should be doing, what my facial expression should be doing. And the third one is trying to formulate what I should say in response. I don't know, maybe there's more streams of consciousness because I'm like, then I'm also trying to figure out where to jump into the conversation in order for it to make sense. And then there's another stream of consciousness where I'm almost just like observing it from up in the corner and just like wondering how the heck it's all going and like why I'm being so awkward. Um, so that's my life, guys. Um, copy paste. I didn't know that was a thing until I realized. Yeah, I can blend with anyone's. It's kind of like a chameleon thing, right? Like, um, yeah, I just feel like we can blend into a lot of things. It's kind of like um, another autistic trait can be watching um, movies or TV shows and really identifying with a character. And you might pick up on certain phrases or body language movements that this character has, and you might replicate those in your life. You might find that you still use some of those phrases um, from when you were younger. And it's kind of like that chameleon thing of like we pick up on little aspects of different personalities and we kind of adopt them um, because it's almost like we see somebody else do it so it feels safe and then we kind of add it to our bag of tricks and I think I've talked about this before but I'm like um, a personality type junkie so I love like the Enneagram and um, Myers-Briggs and that kind of stuff but I feel like when I was younger I would take these tests based off of almost like the last character that I had just seen like in a movie or or a TV show And I would kind of adopt those characteristics for myself and not really know like who I was, if it was like one of my characteristics or something from that character that I had just picked up on. So um, I only, I recently retook the Myers-Briggs test and I think I tested as an ISTJ, the advocate. Um, And that really made a lot of sense to me. I feel like it was the first time I took the test where I was like, I understand what my answer is to this test um, and not like a fake answer, which on that, okay, on that note, this is important. So I, I feel like it's important on like autism assessments, questionnaires, if you've taken one online, let's say like the autism spectrum quotient or the ASPE quiz, 
have you felt like when you're taking those tests that you map like your answers are a mask? Because I was talking about this with somebody else, and it was interesting watching her take the test because she was like, I know what the right answers are, but I don't know what my answers are. And and we were like, but there's there's not right answers, you know, because it's like about you. But it's almost like when I read originally before before I was more aware of my own personal traits and stuff, I hope I'm making sense. I would read these test questions and, and think like, I know what the right answer is, but what do I actually feel? So that's something that I really want to explore in the future is like adapting autism questionnaires and assessments to be able to accommodate that masking trait in autistic people, right? Because I think so many times when autistic people take those tests, the answers reflect more of a mask than their actual autism. Does that make sense? Am I making any sense? Ooh, ISFJ. (laughs) Cool. Oh, my favorite topic. Okay. Everybody look. Okay. Enneagram. Have I said what I am on the Enneagram? Does anybody have any guesses? I don't know if I've like given enough personal information to know, but if you have a guess about what I am on the Enneagram, I'd be super curious to hear that. Um, Sarah says, yes, you mask when taking the autistic test. Took a while to answer, answer truthfully. Okay. I'm glad I'm not the only one. Um, Hans Augustine says, you question yourself a million times on any test. Okay. All right. So this is the thing y'all are like resonating with this. I feel the same way. Like I feel like, um, here's another thing. Okay. So I feel like the, the autism questionnaires assessments, they need to accommodate for the fact that autistic people, first and foremost, their first answer is going to be a mask or their instinct is going to be a mask. Like what's the most socially appropriate answer. Secondly, I forgot my stream of consciousness where it was going, but it's going to come back to me really soon. Oh, um, my ADHD is all over the place. Cause right now I want to tell you that I think in like chunks of, like, I think in chunks of understanding that it doesn't necessarily have words to it. So like, I know the concept of what I want to communicate to you, but now I have to find the actual words to say it. Also on the test, we need specific um, examples. So if there's a question that's like, okay, there's one, there's one question on the assessment that's like, I would prefer to go to the library than a party or a library. I would, I would prefer to go to a library than a theater. And I'm just like, that is a horrible question for me. Cause like, I love both of those places. Right. So I'm like, that is way too hypothetical. Like you have to narrow it down. It has to be a specific a specific scenario, right? Because I just get too in my head about it. If it's a vague question that's not defined in like time or space or like my current outlook on life or emotions, you know, like I'm just like, I, how I answer this is going to be different every single day that I answer it. So I don't know if anybody else has felt the same way about kind of the sprawling hypotheticalness of those questionnaires. Oh, my son is going to try to find me. I think my husband's going to stop him. Um, Okay. I'm just going to keep going down a couple of the female characteristics, but y'all shout out in the comments if there's like a particular one that you want to talk about. Because I'll probably wrap up here in the next five or 10 minutes. Um, We've got a friend coming over tonight and we're making burrito bowls. So I got to get cooking on stuff. Um. Sue Ann hates the theater question. I know, Sue Ann, I know, I know. It's like, it's the theater is noisy at first, but then it quiets down and everyone watches the play. I love art. I love live entertainment. There's something for me, like, about being in a flow state, you know, and seeing people do live entertainment. It's just one of my all-time favorite things. Like, I feel like it's such a great way to be present and in the moment. Anyway, I'm getting distracted. Um, okay, so I'm just going to keep mentioning a few of these autistic traits, but if there's anything specific that you want to hit before, um, before our time is up today, just put it over in the comments. Okay. All right. The next one is being labeled sensitive or gifted. How many, okay. Just put like, 
I don't know, put an exclamation point in the comments if this was a term that was ever used to describe you whenever you were growing up or recently. Um, <laughs> it's really hard for my executive function to read comments and like, okay, we're getting a lot of exclamation points to read comments here coming in and like form commentary on those comments. It's, it's difficult. Okay. So sensitive or gifted, I would say that I was labeled both of those things whenever I was younger. Um, a word that maybe the first appointment that I ever had with my psychologist who specializes in adult autism, they encouraged me to use the word responsive instead of sensitive, which I thought was a really great swap. So if that helps you in your life, anytime that, you know, you feel like, oh, I'm being too sensitive or anything, if you can switch it to the perspective of like, oh, I'm being responsive to something that's happening, right? Um, I think that that's been a really helpful change for me. But the use of these two terms, thank you, Whitney, for the encouragement. I actually really appreciate that. <laughs> it's hard because like I, I know it's boring like when I'm just looking and reading the comments, but I also like want to acknowledge what y'all are saying. So, okay. I try to do it quickly and then my brain is kind of like, cuh -cuh, cuh -cuh, cuh -cuh. Um, so anyways, using those two terms, sensitive and gifted, I think a lot of times... I was going to say is a mask. I know we've been using that word. Um, I was going to say it masks over like under the surface issues like autism. Um, it just, I think it can prevent teachers, parents from seeing autistic tendencies whenever we just are quick to use that word. Right. Um, especially girls because we have different expectations placed on us in terms of being socially appropriate and conducting ourselves in a different way than boys, because, you know, boys are just, they develop slower and it makes sense that they're wild and crazy and that they're not, you know, sitting in their seats and doing things the way they're supposed to. So as females, we like keep ourselves in our chair and we put our, and, and this is not, you might not have had this experience, but many times we'll follow the rules, keep the attention off of us. Um, and we'll really, really be struggling internally, but we'll receive these labels of like, oh, you're just sensitive and gifted, which I think to me just reinforce that idea that everyone has anxiety. I feel like those two things are related, you know, like, oh, you're gifted. This is your life. This is how you interact with the world. You're gifted and sensitive. And to me, I was like, I guess that just means that everything should feel really hard <laughs> and that I should be working all the time and never feel like my brain is resting um, so it's sad because I feel like, um, we need a better understanding of this as a society in order to help recognize the girls that are struggling. And even my daughter who's eight, um, you know, she, she doesn't have a formal autism diagnosis. She met all the criteria except for, um, social, um, and the psychologist said that those might start coming to the surface as she gets older and they already have. So that's been, like a year and a half since her diagnosis or evaluation. So it's just like, we need ways to catch this stuff better and sooner. And, and like her teachers at school be like, Oh yeah, she's doing great. She's like, nothing's ever wrong. Like everything's fine. And, you know, I come back to this over and over and over again, but Orion's video on the Coke bottle effect is so great. Um, and um, that probably seems like a really random comment, but if you watch that video, it will kind of describe to you how, how we can make everything look okay on the surface. Um, but every time something upsets us, it's like shaking a Coke bottle. And so on the outside, everybody just sees normal Coke bottle. But then, you know, when you get to a safe place where you feel like you can let it all go, it just starts spewing everywhere. So yeah, we need a better system for communicating about how this represents in females. Um, Whitney says sensitivity was equated to weakness growing up. Yeah, unfortunately. Yeah, which I, you know, the older I get, I, I feel like sensitivity and responsiveness, we'll use that word, I think is actually a tremendous sign of strength in reality, you know, because um, sensitivity, being responsive to your environment, it, it requires being present. It requires being mindful um, it, you know, I think it's a really great quality because so many people are 
you know, so many people try to be tough and just rub dirt on it. And I feel like a lot of times that causes us not to deal with our issues or the problems that we're really facing, but sensitive, kind souls are, are so important, um, to the world and just to relationships. And I feel like, I feel like that quality should really be treasured a lot more than it is. So again, if you want to switch to using the word responsive, I feel like that's been really, really helpful for me. And it doesn't have that negative connotation to me. It feels much more kind of proactive and um, it feels like a more respectful term to me in some regards. So, um, okay. I think there was a comment up here. Let me scroll real quick. And Augustine said, explain to your spouse how a shutdown is happening and has anyone dealt with migraine that causes face numbness Oof. prior to prior or during a shutdown? Okay. If, if anybody has experienced a migraine that causes face numbness, maybe give a message um, to Anne's Augustine. I'm sorry that you're dealing with that. Okay. How to explain to your spouse that a shutdown is happening? Do you lose words when a shutdown is happening? Um, have you ever tried writing? Um, first of all, I would maybe make sure that your spouse knows what a shutdown is. Um, when a shutdown, like before a shutdown happens, like you want to communicate this information before you get into a shutdown, obviously, um, a shutdown looks like this for you, you know, it might be, um, that you have a migraine. It might be that you stop talking. It might be that you need to be alone. It might be that, um, lights and sounds bother you. So, um, you know, delving into meltdowns and shutdowns is a huge topic, but, um, you know, I think first off, identify what that looks like for you and then communicate that to your spouse, um, outside of a meltdown. And if you can't communicate verbally during a meltdown, is there any other way that you could communicate? Um, you know, you could put something in writing, you could text maybe, I think I've done that to my husband before. Like I've texted him. I'm like, Hey, I'm not mad at you. I just, I just need some space or whatever. Um, another thing I'm thinking is if you had like, I don't know, like a magnet on the fridge or something that you could put up to just be like, this represents that I'm in meltdown mode or something. So I think, um, what I'm, what's coming to my mind right now is just having a plan beforehand and having a way to communicate that, that works for you, um, based off of your previous experience when you've been in a meltdown, like anything that you are capable of doing, I would lean on, I would lean into that to help you communicate and, and maybe also communicate what you need in those instances. Um, maybe time alone, maybe a large glass of water. A lot of times I realize I'm dehydrated in those situations. Um, so maybe drinking water in a quiet room by yourself, um, laying on a pillow that could look different for all of us taking a bath. So if you can communicate those needs, maybe your spouse will feel like in some way they can help, you know? Um, yeah, those, those are my two cents right now. And then if anybody has feedback on the headache thing, um, Oh, Ryan, misdiagnosis is a big thing for girls and women like ADHD or eating disorder rather than, yeah. Yeah. Misdiagnosis is, is, it is a really big thing. And I think that kind of plays into the terms that we were talking about, like sensitive and, um, gifted. There's just different ways of labeling girls, this thing. Like I, and I think there's, I think there's a lot of stigma behind the word autism and in general, you know, in entertainment and the media, we have seen primarily male representations of autism. And so I think wrapping our mind around calling a female autistic is kind of like for a lot of people, it doesn't fit. Um, you know, I was talking with someone else the other day about this topic, and it just seems like it might be harder for them to wrap the, the, their mind around that um, that their daughter could be autistic. Um, I just think it's a, I think that it's a really tough pill for some people to swallow. Like if it was called something different, I think I've talked about this before. If autism was called like cool people brain or something, you know, like. Um, you know, would it be easier to diagnose people with it? I just think it leaves, I think the word autism leaves a bad taste in some people's mouth because we have more work to do in terms of describing what it is. And, um, you know, I think you'll notice on my channel that I tend to use the word autistic more than I do autism. I like the 
adjectival form of the word um because i don't i don't like saying like i have autism right like i am autistic i you can't separate me from from my autism and it i think that ism kind of makes it sound like something that you have right um so i i really like to use the word autistic more and i feel like it all just kind of plays into that stigma <sighs> So yeah, it is a misdiagnosis a lot of times. And that's kind of what I talk about in my next video that I'm putting out on ADD and ADHD, which I'll hopefully have out tomorrow. Um, it's ADD is misdiagnosed and underdiagnosed in women a lot too. So it's really important that we educate ourselves on this and also advocate for ourselves whenever we feel like, um, whenever we feel like things don't line up. And that reminds me of another point um, in the video about <clears throat> gaslighting ourselves. Unfortunately, this is this is probably the main point that I wanted to touch on. Um, yes. Stacy, I'm trying to understand your comment. Maybe give me some more information on that one. Are you saying like you don't think autism is a superpower? I totally get that. Totally get that. Um, yeah, and I'm. Yeah, I have I have a lot of feelings about that. But so the main point that I wanted to, I think, address is that we can be really great at gaslighting ourselves. Gaslighting is being led to believe something that is true is not true. Um, and so a lot of times females tend to downplay our challenges and our difficulties because we see somebody else doing it and we think, oh, they were able to handle this. So I should be able to handle this, or they were able to do this without taking a break. So I should be able to do this without taking a break. Another one is, well, I lived this long without a diagnosis, so maybe I don't need it. Um, you know, that's gaslighting because we're trying to talk ourselves out of something that would be helpful or add value to our lives. Um, so that's just something I want us all to become aware of. Um, I find that we generally, excuse me, are really more well connected to ourselves than we realize. And our body gives us so much great feedback about what we want and need. And we've, we've gotten out of the habit of listening to and respecting those signals that our body gives us. Um, and so I'm just, I just want to give you, I mean, it feels not that I need to give you permission, but I, I want to give you just encouragement to, to listen to your body and to listen to your, your thoughts and your feelings when they're speaking to you, because I would say more often than not, um, our intuition is a pretty, it's a pretty good thing to bet on. So, um, yeah, if you find yourself gas, gaslighting yourself, um, yeah, just gently acknowledge it. Maybe get curious about why you are doing that and maybe where it came from. And I think that's one of the, the best ways that we can start changing those patterns. Yes, no idea how much you've been gaslighting yourself. Yeah, that's what happened when I went to therapy. <laughs> I really was like, oh, I'm talking myself out of a lot of things that I know to be true in order to make other people more comfortable. Look at this little baby hair that I have. I think I told you all I have alopecia, so my hair falls out. And I'm always so proud of my little baby hairs, but they kind of just like do their own thing. Kind of crazy. Um, yeah. Gaslighting is a real thing. Oh, somebody's birthday's coming up. Happy early birthday, mommy vlogs. Okay. Everybody's relating to the gaslighting thing. So I want us to just, to just maybe make a personal commitment today to yourself to just try to become more aware of it. I think, um, maybe you become aware of how it feels in your body. So for me, it's almost like an itchiness. It's like, um, it, like a discomfort in my skin, kind of like my skin is crawling. And I think it's almost like, cause I know I'm not being true to myself or I'm not, I'm not comfortable with the things that I'm thinking or feeling. So if you can kind of recognize how gaslighting yourself or being gaslit by somebody else, registers in your body. That's another really great way to start becoming aware of when it happens. And then definitely not beating yourself up about it because that's not helpful. Um, but just kind of, um, 
there's a meditation technique that I learned about one time where you just kind of observe something as like a bubble and you just kind of touch it and your mind just like pop the bubble. So oh, that was a gaslighting thought, you know, okay, it was there. Now I recognize it and now I can move on to something else. So mindfulness can be really helpful with that. Okay, Sierra, people say things like nobody likes X, Y, and Z when we're trying to say that things affect us more. We know that's true. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that'll play into a lot. Like what I was saying about autistic needs being being um, seen as preferences. And I'd really like to be able to speak more about that after we have, after I have a discussion on that this weekend. Stacy, how is getting a diagnosis helpful when the majority of your life has passed by? Well, I don't know. Um, anybody in the comments that wants to kind of give your two cents, but I think somebody in the comments, oh my gosh, it was an older woman who said it beautifully. I think she was diagnosed at 70 and she, it just meant the world to her. You know, she was like, I've lived so much of my life, but now I just feel like a piece of me that I've always wanted to be understood is now understood. And she felt empowered now with that diagnosis to be able to share her journey with other people and help other people. Um, on the spectrum, not just on the spectrum, but just people I think who feel misunderstood. So I think that journey is going to be different for everybody. And I can't answer that question for you if getting a diagnosis is what is the direction you should go in. But I would say that for me, I mean, completely life-changing. And it really helped me not gaslight myself as much because then things weren't in my head. You know, I wasn't like, oh, I'm just making this up, you know, whatever. Then I had something on paper and I was like, oh, this is a real thing. This is really happening. So I can't answer that question for you, but um, yeah. Anybody else who has your own experiences, feel free to share them. Um, Pass is self-gaslighting a kind of self-victim blaming? I don't know. I don't know how to answer that. I'll have to think about that. Some questions I have to go too far into my brain to think about on a live stream. And I also saw your question about, um, Pasageo, I also saw your question about gender being a social construct. Um, and that's a super interesting topic that I am very keen on talking about. I just don't have the words today to delve into it. I'm like finding my executive functioning draining as I go. So um, I do think that it is a social construct and there's so much that we can unpack there. Um so maybe that's another topic that we can jump into another day. Okay. I'm going to finish these comments really quickly. Sierra, it was about validating yourself and giving yourself permission to be true to yourself. Absolutely. Being more compassionate towards yourself after diagnosis. Totally agree with that. Um, Needs versus preferences. Okay, I'm excited about doing that. I'll I'll work on that for y'all. Um, Mike T or Mick T, how can you deal with having to talk to people? Um, we'll save that for another day, but I do have a video on, um, what did I call it? Like boundaries, boundaries and social situations or something like that. I think it's um, under my playlist, autism and relationships. It might be helpful to you in the meantime until we can have a discussion on it. Um, M3, honestly, you want to get a diagnosis, but the whole process feels long and hard and overwhelming. I get that. And I, I felt the same way too. And it is kind of long and it is kind of hard and overwhelming. Um, if you are interested in going that route, my advice is just take it one teeny tiny baby step at a time. If it's something that you want to do, just, you know, your first step could just be, you know, researching where you would even get it done and just go into it with knowing like you don't have to figure everything out right now just to get one teeny tiny step. But I totally agree. It, it can be really daunting. Thank you all for the comments back to other people that I haven't been able to respond to. That's super helpful. It's exciting because we're getting more people in our chats, you know, um, it's cool. So I'm, I'm having to learn how to kind of uh, flow with with so many comments and oh I always forget to mention it now that we're at the end of the stream but there's these options at the bottom what are they called 
He's like, oh, a super sticker and a super chat. So if you want to use either of those, it'll make your um, comment like stay up at the top for longer and it'll like accent your comment um, so that I will see it. And, you know, in the past, I'm like, I don't really think we need that. But now I'm, now I can kind of see how that would be helpful um, going forward. So in our live streams, if you find that I'm not able to get to your stuff, um, you can use those super chats and super stickers and it'll basically be like, you know, tell me to look at that comment and you'll have a better chance of getting your question answered. Um, okay. Hey, Harold. I'm glad you're here. Um, I'm laughing just because I'm, we're kind of closing up. I just want to make sure I get all these comments over here. Okay. <laughs> Jennifer, I can see your point in like having the term Asperger's versus autism and seeing how that could be helpful because it feels like it's harder for people to believe you that you have an autism diagnosis rather than Asperger's. Um, I do think that there needs to, I do think that it could be helpful to have more different, more differentiation within the diagnostic criteria of autism because autism looks so different from person to person. And so I think it could be really helpful. Like um, the video that I'm doing tomorrow is over seven different types of ADD. And these were categorized by a neuropsychiatrist that I just adore. I'm like fangirl of Dr. Daniel Amen. And I feel like those seven categorizations of ADD are so helpful because it, it can present really differently. And so I think it'd be really helpful to have different segments of an autism diagnostic criteria that would help better explain the different presentations of it. And I think that could actually help with the society's kind of uh, outlook on how it's received and everything. If there were different kind of categories that could better represent um, the people, right? So um, thank you, Harold. Um, also, my biggest fear is that no, you're not autistic. You're just, yeah, I know, I know, I know. Um, well, this is kind of a fun problem to have. Um, you'll just keep posting great comments. And I was hoping to wrap up around 3.30. I do have a lot that I need um, to do this afternoon and evening. And I um, think I'm kind of extra prone to burnout and meltdown right now because I that happened to me last weekend. I had my birthday celebration. Thank you all for the birthday wishes. And I don't think I realized how much it affected me to have all of like the family messages coming in and like people calling and people texting and, um, and, you know, just all of the little social interactions here and there. And I woke up the day after my birthday weekend and I just felt like a train had hit me and I'd had a super chill birthday weekend. It was like, super chill. We didn't really do anything big. So anyways, I just want to be, I just want to respect, um, my personal stamina right now. So, um, I love, I love interacting with you all. Thank you all for showing up. And the discussion today, I think was super, um, insightful based on y'all's, um, comments and suggestions and input. So this is a really great group here. And, um, I hope that you feel like this is a safe community where you can share your own experiences. If there is something that you feel like you need to get off your chest um, that you aren't able to say in the comments, you can um, find my email address in the about section of my YouTube channel. That's always an option. And then um, thank y'all all for the late birthday wishes. And um, hey, Elizabeth. Um, and you can always support me uh, at my PayPal account, paypal.me slash mom on the spectrum. There's several of you who do that regularly. And that like every time I see it in my inbox, I'm like, oh my gosh, that's so sweet. So just know that that helps so much. Um, I spend a lot of time researching all these topics and I really, really enjoy it. And I just really appreciate all the support and encouragement that y'all give along the way. So um, to those of you whose questions I was not able to get to, I am sorry. Um, it's kind of exciting though, that we have so many people that it's just like, um, there's so much good discussion. So I will talk to y'all all soon. My next video, um, the seven types of ADD, ADHD, hopefully I'll upload, a little, see my, my words are going, I'll upload that sometime tomorrow. And um, maybe we can do another live stream sometime next week. Okay. Okay. It's cool having people. Oh, I love that. Y'all are my people. I love it. 
Okay. Y'all have a great weekend and I will talk to y'all soon. Bye.